Hey everyone, Tony D with another screenwriting tip. Uh, this is another question from Techazine, who uh, posted some questions uh, before. And he is working on a Mafia screenplay, and he asked a couple of uh, interesting questions, some which will apply to other screenplays. But the main question he asked is, can your fictional characters beat real people? The answer is yes and no. Um, historical people generally are okay, especially people who uh, are long since dead and they're, you know, they're, they're in the public domain, essentially. Politicians are especially okay and, uh, um, you know, people like that, historical figures. When you get in under 75 years, 50 years, that's when the copyrights start to kick in. Uh, and that's when it gets a little tougher. So, you know, when you get to people say like Marilyn Monroe and Elvis and James Dean, they're dead, but their images uh, are owned by companies and uh, their estates still may be active. So it, it kind of depends on the person you pick. Um, the same may or may not be true of mobsters. Um, the families may object to the characterization, um, and it's a, it's a, uh, it's difficult because it depends on the kind of story you're doing. So, like when they did The Irishman, right? Uh, Martin Scorsese and De Niro and Pesci, they based it on a book, right? And so the book says this, and they're just following the book. So. Uh, the book has sort of already vetted the material. And so Jimmy Hoffa is a historical figure. He's in the book. This is sort of an eyewitness account. You know, they kind of can, if, if, so, if for instance, the Hoffa estate were to sue over this, they would have to, you know, if they went after the movie, the movie would just point at the guys who wrote the book, right? And one of the guys who wrote the book was the main character, and he's dead. So they're kind of saved that way. Um, it also has to be the kind of thing that, you know, isn't true, basically. It has to, it has to somehow harm, harm uh, uh, the estate in some way. So it kind of, like the Hoffa estate, I don't think they're doing a tremendous amount of merchandising for Jimmy Hoffa. Um, but someone say like Stan Lee, that's a different story. Um, he, his estate and he's only recently passed, but his estate may have, there may be some value in his image and you portraying him in a movie and your characters meeting him, uh, that may violate the estate in some way. And they could say, you're hurting the estate, you're hurting... Stan's image and our money and we're going to sue for damages or whatever. So short answer is you need permission unless the person's really old. Unless the person's like a hundred, you know, has been dead for a hundred years or whatever. Um, you know, you obviously you could do Abe Lincoln, right? Abe Lincoln's been dead for, uh, what, over a hundred years. I, th I think you're fine. Um, it's when you get in, let's say, you would have to get anywhere in 1940. Once you get to around 1940, that's when it, uh, you know, things start to hit the public domain. Um, and, and two, it depends on if some movie company or studio took a likeness. So, for instance, uh, in the case of Zorro, right? Uh, Zorro, I believe, is in the public domain. I'd have to check again. But you, you, you could do, for instance, Zorro if he's in the public domain, the original Zorro, or a variation of it. But you could not do, say, George Hamilton's Zorro and the Gay Blade. See, that's a different Zorro. And that particular Zorro is copywritten. Um, obviously, you're not talking about that. You're talking about real people. It also depends, like if you're doing a documentary, it's usually not a problem because that kind of falls under journalism and you're not, you know, 
that 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 would be different. But see, since you're doing a fictionalized story, that's when it gets complicated. Um, you know, it, it, it depends. Now, though, there's work workarounds to it. Um, you could always do a character who's like that, right? Uh, you you change the character enough so people realize it's not the same. It's not the same person. It's a person like that. It's a person in that realm. So let's say you wanted to do uh, a more recent mafia figure who's still alive and use him uh, alongside of a fictional character that you created. So you create, let, let, let's say it's, uh, I don't know, Someone like uh, Joey Merlino, who's still alive. He, I don't think he's in the organization anymore, um, but he's still around, and obviously you can't use him, but you could create a character who's just like him, who has a different name, a different look, you know, and, and would be similar enough that it would provide the same, fu you know, function in your story. Now, if you're looking to capitalize on the fame or infamy, in the case of mobsters, um, you got to get their permission if they're still alive and if they're they've got some kind of estate. It's it's complicated with mobsters because some of them are obscure, nobody knows them, and other ones wrote books. They're kind of famous, like uh, Henry Hill, you know, and Goodfellas. Uh, Henry, you know, he really licensed himself around. Um, he was working on a role-playing game <laughs> and, uh, I was actually going to work on that role-playing game and the guy who ran the company I heard had embezzled the money out of it, um, and never did the game. And that was sort of the inspiration for me to go, well, you know, if he's not going to do a mafia game, I'll, sh I'll go ahead and do it. And that's why I did complete mafia for D20. Um, so you know, it, it's complicated. You have to do some research. You know, I've had clients come to me and say, oh, I want to do this story. And it's this big conspiracy. And it involves, you know, uh, this guy and this guy. And they're all famous people, you know, for the last, say, 40 or 50 years. You can't really do that without their permission. You know, you can't just start throwing those names out, out there because what you're essentially doing is the interest in your story will be those famous people. It won't be in your story. So, you know, in terms of uh, his other question was building a main character for a mob story. Well, you know, the classic character is uh, someone the audience sympathizes with, even though he's a bad guy. So, you know, uh, Henry Hill there's probably, even though he did some bad things in the movie, he's generally portrayed as not the worst guy in the room, right? That's Joe Pesci's character. He's like out of his mind. And then, you know, everybody's trying to kill uh, Henry and, and, and a bunch of other people. And, uh, you know, it, but that's based on, I believe, the book that Henry wrote. And so, obviously... There's probably some bias in there um, because Henry is obviously going to pray, portray himself as the good guy. So, you know, when when you're doing a fictional mob character, I mean, people, it's just like any other character, really. People got to be able to root for him. You got to have a guy who, even though he does bad things, you know, maybe deep down he has a code. Maybe deep down he loves his family and his grandmother. You know, you got to have some reason for us to root for him a little bit, even if he's a bad guy. You know, with uh, Michael and the Godfather, uh, I think a lot of time you, you root for him partly because he's a nice guy in the beginning. And really, he gets involved in the family business because he has this sense of honor about protecting his family. And that's, you know, a positive for him. But, you know, it eventually corrupts him too. And, but, you know, he doesn't kill, uh, spoilers, uh, he doesn't kill his brother until after his mother dies. Um, you know, he, he, he tries to take care of everybody, uh, even though he does that, you know, it, and, and it's about his transformation, just becoming more and more cold hearted and, and, 
uh, kind of just like his dad. Um, so you got to create a character that we like. I mean, that's what you have to do. Um, for, for mobsters, you have to justify. I mean, one way to do it is to make all the other mobs, mobsters around them around him so much, much worse. I mean, that's one way of doing it. Um, you could also create situations where the guys they kill or hurt kind of deserve it, you know? So you get a guy who maybe owes you money and you're going to go beat him up, let's say, in the movie, right? And that's kind of a harsh scene. He just goes and beats some guy up who owes him money. But if the guy he goes and beats up kicks a dog, not this little dog, um, or, you know, abuses his wife or something, then the audience kind of sympathizes with the mobster because this guy kind of deserves it. I want to see this guy get his butt kicked because he's a jerk, you know? Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's manipulative, but, uh, you know, in The Irishman, Robert De Niro goes to the butcher and sort of beats up the butcher because he uh, hit his daughter, I guess, or reprimanded her or fired her. I, it's never really quite clear. Um, but, uh, you know, and he, he, you know, it's, a, it's in my view, it's, it does not, it's not, it's, a, it's kind of a poor scene. It feels sort of tacked on. Uh, I, I thought that was one of the weakest scenes in the movie of the Irishman where he beats up the butcher, especially when the butcher like sort of falls against the, the glass of the door and it just like whoosh, breaks out. It feels it feels like the butcher is kind of beating himself up more than Robert De Niro's doing it. You know, Robert De Niro's getting pretty long in the tooth and, uh, you know, he may have been a little too old for that scene. Um, but that's just my opinion. Anyhow. Uh, for your character, again, just make him sympathetic. Make him a guy we can root for, uh, even though he's kind of a dark guy. Even though he may go down a dark path and never come back. Um, you know, we kind of, there's got to be something in him we like. You know, something in him we go, oh, okay. You know, I, I can sort of get behind this guy because, oh, finally got this sticker out of you, Joan. Jeez. Um, you know, some something that we could say, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's the main character. I mean, you know, and again, he doesn't have to be perfect. Henry Hill wasn't perfect in, in, in Goodfellas. Uh, Robert De Niro's character in Casino wasn't perfect. He took things too far, and in the end, he lost everything. I mean, you know, just look at the other movies. You can see how the main characters uh, work. And, you know, you got to also, the important thing, too, for a mobster movie, I think, because there's been so many, is you got to bring something new to the table. You got to have a fresh angle, a fresh look. You can't just, like, sort of roll in there and do the same crap everybody else has done. Um, you know, my review of The Irishman, uh, a lot of it, a lot of the movie, I felt, had retreaded old ground, you know, and it, it didn't really didn't really show us much in in the way of new in that area. So you gotta you gotta bring something new to the table, uh, including a new angle, a new character, you know, a guy with a code that's unusual for the world of the mafia or whatever. Um, a guy who, you know, does it his way, does it does it an unusual way, um, you know, or is uh, is is somehow a better or worse guy. You know, and and you have a transformation in characters, too. So the transformation, you know, could lead him into a very dark, dark path. Um, that's fine, too. Uh, but, you know, we need to like, there need to be some element of him we like, you know. Uh, and you just look at just about any good classic movie in that, in that genre or, you know, you, you can see... If you can't see the good in a the character, then why do you root for him? You know, why do you even watch the movie? You know, you ever sit and, and wonder, well, why am I watching this movie? It's probably because you don't care about the lead character. Um, but you know, it's tough. Mobster movies, it's tough, man. You gotta you gotta bring something new to the table. Bring something new to the table, I say. You know, something unusual, uh, some some kind of twist, something unique that only you can bring, 
And uh, don't try to depend upon cameos. It's not really the way to go. You know, if it takes, if it's a period piece, you know, there may be some work around. Um, you know, the further back you go, the better in that. But uh, it's it's going to be tough. I mean, if you don't have the permission, and and you're talking fiction, yeah, that's 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 not going to work. I suggest if you're going to go fiction, go the whole way. Now, it doesn't mean you can't mention real life characters, right? So. If you have a group of fictional characters who are mobsters, you can mention real life. I mean, they could say things. They could say like, oh, you know, uh, uh, Angelo Bruno, you know, say it takes place in the 70s. Angelo Bruno was the gentle Don of Philadelphia. It's, he, he, he was in The Irishman. Um, so, you know, you could mention like, oh, I got to go to Philly and meet uh, Boss Bruno or whatever. You know, you could, you could drop in a line like that. It, it's not going to infringe. But to actually show the character actually have him doing things or, or saying that he did things. Uh, you know, that's where, that's where you get into trouble and keep in mind, I'm not a lawyer, right? So, you know, you got to find out all the legalities if you're going to go down that road. Um, if it's going to be a major part of your screenplay. And that's another thing too, you know, movie companies or production houses that are going to, you know, do your screenplay. They may look at it and say, Oh, you mentioned all these real life people. We, we kind of stay away from that because, uh, you know, if you don't have the rights to these uh, people, we don't, we don't like to mention them or whatever. Uh, we don't want to get sued. We don't even want to take the risk, right? So you got to kind of build it. If you're going to use that, then you got to build sort of a, a, a way you could, you know, just change the names around or whatever. See, that's why I, I suggest going with, with a, a more fictional fictional uh, uh, version, you know? So if you need to use someone uh, who's a real real uh, mobster type and he's from recent history, um, you know, just change him around. Make him, make him like that. Make him perform the same function as that character, but just make him up. I mean, the Sopranos, as I said, they were based, uh, a lot of people think they were based on the Philly mob, you know, that... Tony Soprano really was kind of like Joey Merlino. He was running the organization, but he was technically the underboss. Junior was the boss, but really he didn't have the power. And in the Philly underworld, that was, Ra I think it was Ralph Natale. I, damn it. I, I, three times I've mentioned him in a video and I haven't looked up his name yet. I believe it's Ralph Natale. I want to say to Ralph Natale. Um, so, you know, that's, again, it's a workaround. You know, the Sopranos... No one's going to sue them over to the Sopranos uh, because the Sopranos are a made-up name. They changed it around. Uh, they moved the characters to New Jersey. You know, problem solved. So that's what you should do. That's my advice. Stay away from using real people in a fictional name, you know, fictional works, unless, you know, again, it's like Abe Lincoln or, uh, you know, earlier. 